Thank you very much, Steve. It's a real pleasure today to speak to all of you about our research. I'd like to start by thanking you all for your support in this research. CRI's mission and our mission at St George's is to prevent young sudden cardiac death. And 16% of all the money that's raised by all of you goes into research. And I would say that around 4 million, just above 4 million, has been invested in the sort of research I'm going to talk to you about. And that is how we've improved the way that we screen young people. Now, what I should tell you is that if you look around the British Heart Foundation or other websites, you will learn that the incidence of death from cardiovascular disease in our population is going down, okay? Less people are smoking, more people are being diagnosed with silent hypertension, raised cholesterol levels and diabetes, and by treating all of these diseases, we are reducing the risk of cardiovascular death. But this is in people who are 60, 70, 80 or 90. We have made very little impact in reducing young sudden cardiac death in those people who look ostensibly well and healthy, not the ones that are actually born with very serious congenital heart disease. So what I need to show you today is how we've gone about doing that. Clearly, we don't learn a lot about young sudden cardiac death until a young athlete dies suddenly. And when this happens, these types of tragedies are publicized very well by the media, and the media draw concerns about the youth of the individual, the fact that they epitomize the healthiest segment of our society, the fact that they had no warning symptoms. Why did this happen? Okay. We've learned a lot about deaths from these athletes and with what Mary's told you, but most young people in this country either die from faults of the electrical system of the heart, from heart muscle abnormalities, sometimes due to a problem with the blood vessels, and sometimes due to acquired condition. But the vast majority die from inherited or congenital abnormalities that can be diagnosed during life, and for which there are several treatments that can modify the natural history of these diseases and even prevent sudden death. And these range from lifestyle modification to tablets to ablation to implanting a cardioverter defibrillator or even surgical therapy. But there are many treatments. And because sport is so visible, there are many incentives in sport, at least, to identify such young individuals. And these include mandatory cardiac evaluations supported by the Football Association or the Lawn Tennis Association, <coughs> voluntary charity-based assessments. In fact, that's how we started at Crime. When I met Alison, Alison was concerned about sports people running into trouble and dying because these were the sort of deaths that were publicized. And we started our whole program focusing on sport initially. Of course, sometimes an, an athlete may be diagnosed because they've got symptoms or they've got a family member which is, who has this condition. And if we look at the way we test sports people, because sudden death is relatively rare, and I'll come to the general population as well, we have to use a relatively cost-effective method. When you're, doing, when you're trying to identify a situation where death rates are quite small, you have to think about, we've got to do this, but we've got to do this relatively cheaply because we will not be able to afford to do this in 21 million people. So we do this by speaking to the individual and by doing a very simple test called the ECG, which is the cheapest and the most widely available test. And I can tell you the results of this in an Italian population where this type of screening is mandatory in people who play sport. So if you're in Italy and you play regular systematic sport, then you are required to have an, a, a, a health questionnaire, a physical examination and an ECG, and you will only be allowed to play if they've excluded cardiac disease. So here we've got a chart with two lines on it. We've got a red line, which is death rates in athletes, and we've got a yellow line, which is death rates in non-screened non-athletes. And that goes over about 24 years. 
you'll see that the yellow line in the people that don't do any exercise and aren't screened doesn't change very much. You see the red line in people who do sport, when screening started, it went down, the death rate went down from 3.6 per 100,000 to 0.9 per 100,000. So the Italians have shown that screening with ECG and a health questionnaire has reduced the sudden risk of sudden death in athletes by 90%. Okay, These are athletes, they do not make up our general population. But I want to draw your attention to this photograph here of young people, and I want you to look very carefully at these young people. Some of you may even recognize some people in this photograph. But none of them look ill. All of them look very happy. All of them look as if they will, leave, they will live into the age of 80 or 90. And all of them look like they will contribute a lot to society if we can identify them early and do something about them. I'll also tell you that the most people in these photographs had no warning symptoms before they died. So what happens in this country? Which young people, which young person gets NHS treatment? Well, to get NHS screening, you've got to have symptoms such as chest pains, breathlessness that's disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed, palpitation or a blackout, or you need a family history of someone in your family who has died under the age of 50 or who has a genetic cardiac condition. Now there's only one problem with that and that is that most young people that die do not have any warning symptoms. Sudden death is the first manifestation. So we will have missed 80% of people. The second thing is although we put a lot of emphasis on family history, most young people do not know there is a family history of, of, of genetic disease because their parents may be sitting on genetic diseases that have not affected them and therefore they haven't presented, but they've given those diseases to their children who are most vulnerable. So their parents have shown that they've lived through this, but that doesn't mean to say that they don't have the condition. So what we decided to do, and it was Alison's idea, was look, there's one thing looking at the creme de la creme, the athletes, who are probably selected out. The fact you can play at regional and national level means that you are unlikely to have a heart condition. It's those people that never did well in PE at school that probably did have something wrong with them, that they put down to being overweight or being unhealthy or unfit, that are more likely to have cardiac problems. So she set up this screening program which was the first of its type in this country where anybody aged between 14 and 35 years old in the UK could be screened. Now at the time that this was set up there was a lot of criticism and a lot of resistance amongst MPs, amongst um, various um, academic bodies and even health professionals but we continued to do so because we were doing this under the supervision of Bill McKenna, who was the professor of cardiology, and I was doing this with him. And we did exactly the Italian model, health questionnaire and a 12-lead ECG in young people. We started off screening about five to 600 people a year, but this really, really uh, picked up momentum, and we're now doing between 20 and 30,000 every year. And here you will see uh, some of some of our fellow for, for former fellows, including my. I wasn't uh, doing that very often. I probably only did it for the camera, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were doing. We were testing young people uh, and trying to find what the prevalence was. Now, clearly, we got a lot of information from all of this. But the government had concerns, and so did everyone else. Why are you doing this? Sudden death is so rare. What about all these funny squiggles you're going to find on someone's ECG and worry them to death and they'll have nothing wrong with them? False positive results. What happens when you test a young person and then they go on to die later on? When you tell them they were fine and you reassured them, what's the litigation cost going to be? How much is it going to cost you all to do this? Can the NHS actually afford it? Are there issues? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the, spe the specialists? Do we know what to do with these people once we've diagnosed them? So we were up against all this. This was never going to take off if it, if it wasn't for someone 
with the energy that Alison had. I was just a junior cardiologist thinking, oh my God. And it was, it was Alison who provided steel in my lumbar spine to just stay upright <laughs> and duck everything as it was coming my way. But this is what they were all looking at. And this is, we, 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 Michael joined us and we looked at the Office of National Statistics and we looked at death rates from cardiac problems in people in this country. The yellow bar is death rates in people in their 60s and 80s. That's 120,000. The red bar is death rates in young people. That's only 600. So you can see where the government's coming from. 120,000 versus 600. Surely we should be putting our money into 120,000. But what one has to remember is that when someone dies at the age of 20 years old, they lose 63 years of life. Now, if I multiplied 63 times 600, I come up with a very large figure. And if that large figure number of 80-year-olds died in one year, that would be considered as an epidemic. So when I tell you it like that, this is a big deal. This is not a small deal. And that's why we continued. We also had to show them that the number of people living in this country that have these conditions is much higher than they think. And that came from the cry screening program. Well, we screened everyone with the history and 12 lead ECG, and it, if it was normal, we discharged them. If it was abnormal and suggestive of something wrong with the heart, they got a heart scan on site to look for structural abnormalities of the heart. If we didn't find anything, we referred them on to regional clinics or to our clinic, and if they didn't find anything, they were discharged. But what we found, <coughs> that when we did this exercise, and I'm not talking about 1,000 people, I'm talking about 30, 40, 50, 60, 100,000 people, we found that one in 300 young people, and I should use the word at least one in 300 young people in this country have a cardiac condition that could potentially kill them. Now this became a, a big issue for us, this is a lot. What about false positive results? We know that people who are active, and who exercise regularly have to grow their heart because if they didn't grow their heart, they wouldn't be able to do well in sport. And by growing their heart, they may develop changes on the ECG that simulate cardiac disease. And this may cause a lot of concern for parents, siblings, children, if we say to someone, you may have something wrong with you. And here is a normal ECG, and I don't expect you to understand it. This is, a 12, this, is a, this is an electrical tracing of the heart that takes two or three minutes to perform, and for an expert, uh, about two or three minutes to interpret. And we do this all the time. So the ECG can identify electrical diseases of the heart. Very good news, and you've heard that from Michael. What we did, and we went out of our way, was to determine which ECG patterns are normal in children, in women versus men, in black people versus white people, in long distance runners versus football players. We had to do that to show that the ECG may be effective. We also learned that some athletes, athletic individuals at least, did have ECG changes that overlap with disease processes that we had to learn how to differentiate between these two entities. And you've already seen slides like this. But we had a battery of research fellows that have been through us, and many of these people, in fact, I can say that all of these people are now consultants, or about to, one, one of them's about to get a consultant's job, contributed so much to the way that we interpret a young person's ECG. And probably one of the proudest things that's ever happened to me was that this 10 to 12 years of intensive research funded by all of you culminated for the first time in the history of sports cardiology in something called the international recommendations. These were British recommendations, Dutch, Australian, New Zealand, Canadian, African, these were international, i.e. if you use these criteria anywhere in the world, you were doing a good job. So it was the first time that this was harmonized. <coughs> And what our research has done with ECG screening, which is probably the strongest thing we've done, is that we've reduced false positive rates from 22%, which is when Alice and I first started doing this, 
all the way down to 3% in the white population. So the chances of your family or your children having an ECG screening done by CRI, there's only a 3% chance that we may say we need to do more tests. And there's a 1 in 300 chance that we'll say to you, something's wrong with your kid, and we can actually do something about it and prevent a sudden death in most people with these criteria. And that brings me to something that we have to address. That we have had deaths in people who have been screened by us. I think I can count eight deaths in total since 1997, where we've gone back and looked at the ECG after the death and not been able to find anything wrong with this. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us, one, the ECG is not perfect. It tells us that is a one-off screening really enough? So if you got screened at the age of 18, does that mean nothing will happen to you by 24? We need to address that. Are there things that are staring us in the face that we can't see because we still don't understand certain things? And this is where a lot needs to be invested. So I'll, I'll, I'll go on to cost now. What about cost? Nothing comes for free. And although we can stand here and do research, we know it's been funded by your blood, sweat and tears. And you've had to work very hard to bring this money in. So I will talk to you about athletes first, because that's where most of the data comes from with cost. And I'll talk to you about what we've done with CRY. Here is information on nearly 5,000 athletes that were screened with various ECG criteria. And what I want you to know is that if we used our current criteria devised by CRY, it would cost us around £26,000 to pick up one young person with a very serious condition. Okay? For some of you, not all of you, that will be your whole year's gross salary. That's how much it costs to pick up one person who may have a serious cardiac condition. And it gets you thinking. But let me sh tell you something else. When you become retired citizens, and some of you may be, and you start to want to reap the rewards of having worked all your life, and when you're in your 80s, we will be spending billions on you, billions, to sort out your atrial fibrillation, <laughs> your heart failure, your blocked arteries, to give you back two, three, or four years of life. We'll be spending billions. But we are begrudging spending 26,000 pounds on a young person where a medication like a beta blocker will give them back 60 years of life and allow them to give back to the United Kingdom what we've all giving back to them at the moment. When I say it like that, it's a no-brainer. It's a complete financial no-brainer. And so this is what we did with CRY. This is data from about 27,000 people who were tested through the CRY methodology. 12% were referred for further tests. And you said, but you said the positive rate was 3%. We used the old criteria at that point. We used old criteria for younger people. And this is what we found. That history and physical examination that's in blue would have only picked up 18%. So if we use the British NHS referral system, you'd only pick up 18%. You'd miss 72%. If we screened with the grey circle, the ECG, we picked up 80%. And you'll see that 0.3% of people had serious cardiac diseases. When it comes to cost, history and physical examination, this is what CRY implement, would have resulted in a diagnostic yield at a cost of about £27,000. Had we only used history and examination, which is what our government says, it would have cost about £45,000. So history and examination leads to a greater cost per person diagnosed. We don't diagnose most of them. So if we're going to screen, we need to be screening with the ECG. And in fact, if we, if we screen with the ECG, you would save enough money to do all the additional tests, including genetic testing, and ablate people, and put a defibrillator into people. That's how much money you would save. Finally, other issues, the infrastructure. 
What CRY has been doing since 1997 is developing an infrastructure that the government has not realised as yet. Steve told you that we have trained around 30 juniors. Sabia Gatti just gave you an insight into one such junior. These juniors have fled the, have fled, have fled the nest and have parked themselves all over the country. So it's our aspiration that one day every single young person in this country will be offered ECG screening, not just those who can be bothered to go and log into the CRI. Everyone shall be offered it, and when they are diagnosed, they don't have to come only to St George's Hospital. There are people trained through the money that you have raised that are parked all over the country where, where your children, your friends, your relatives will have access to those people when we pick something wrong up. Okay? Until then, of course, the government's saying we need to be doing other things, like making people better at cardiopulmonary resuscitation could save a life, have lots of defibrillators about, which may save a life. That sounds amazing, and it's laudable, and it's great for people my age and your age, where we're more likely to need a defibrillator than be diagnosed with ECG. But let me show you two important facts. Here is data from Denmark at the top, looking at the place of death. Okay, 68% of people die at home. Around 35% die in their sleep. Where are you going to find the defibrillator? And how are you going to do a CPR on when they're at home in their bedroom and they've died in their sleep? So it sounds great, but if we don't screen, we will miss a lot of these people who have no idea they've got something wrong with them, who die at home in their sleep where there is no scope to ring 999 or seek emergency services. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for raising so much money to support a charity whose mission it is to reduce young sudden cardiac death. Your money has gone a long way into improving the way that we diagnose people, improving what we know about causes of sudden death, improving methods of risk stratification, i.e. when someone's diagnosed, how do you predict whether someone's going to die or not? Clearly there's a long, long way to go. We want to minimise the risk of sudden death and there's a lot to learn and I hope for your continued support. Thank you very much.